must have gotten out that I was speaking because there are people here from all over the country. It's crazy. I just met a couple down here in the front row that flew in all the way from Ohio to hear me preach. I don't know. They're my grandparents, but all the same, they flew in from Ohio. We're going to be continuing our flipped series today out of Matthew chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter 5. I want to take a minute and thank our AV and tech team and our worship team. It is incredible. Um, there, there's no greater feeling than having to step out of worship and realize that everything runs better without you. So there is. Um, but, but we are so appreciative of them. Our tech team is absolutely fantastic. Um, They're doing a wonderful, wonderful job. For those of you guys who don't know, my name is Mark Burkholder. I'm on staff here at Hollywood Community Church as the creative arts director. So I do worship, as you know, and other graphic stuff. Uh, I married my beautiful wife, April Burkholder, now, and this past October, um, you'll see her. She's the angel fluttering around. That's her. Um, but I, I want to introduce, here's a picture of my family, actually. That's right. That's right. We recently found out that we are expecting a child, and that is huge, huge news for us. Um, it is very early on. She's, she's only eight weeks along, but we bring this before you to ask for prayer. We desperately need prayer. For those of you guys who know, um, April has type 1 diabetes, so this makes this pregnancy very high risk. So there's going to be a lot of doctor's appointments, but more important than the doctor's opinions, we need your prayer. Um, so we, we desperately ask that you join us these next several months in prayer so that we can have a healthy baby come October 1st is the due date. All right. And we will definitely keep you guys updated. We're so excited. As I said, we are continuing our flip series through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 7 today. I'm going to read the first seven verses or, or the first part of the Sermon on the Mount up until where we are today. Starting in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come before your children, opening up your word and delivering this message. I know that I am so underqualified to be the vessel of your word, but I ask that your spirit transform my lacking words, that it impacts the spirits of my brothers and sisters in this auditorium this morning. We surrender this time to you. Please show us your mercy and show us how to mimic it in our lives this morning. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know this may be surprising. Uh, there was a point in my life that I did not have the manly man, gorgeous physique that I have right now. Right? I don't know what you're laughing about. <laughs> that was an honest statement, all right? Uh, instead of resembling a, a Brad Pitt, which I obviously do now, I know you were thinking it, I resembled more of a um, jet-puffed marshmallow, you could say, or, or the Pillsbury Doughboy. I would giggle when you poked my tummy. It was really weird. Um, but, but this was kind of my, my childhood. I did not have the strength that many of my peers would have. Uh, my body was made for cuddling, not wrestling, all right? And I firmly believe that, and my wife appreciates it. All right, but, but during my childhood and in middle school, this means that I lacked at certain activities, certain feats of strength that my friends excelled in. I may have been fantastic at seventh grade arithmetic and playing my trombone, but I did not have the abilities that some others did. Some examples are arm wrestling, all right? Arm wrestling is so cool if you're good at it. I wasn't, all right? Some other things are tag. I would hide behind the tree when we played tag. Uh, racing or running, I still avoid that one. Try to stay away far, as far away from that as possible. But the one that I remember was absolutely miserable and <laughs> that I continued to play and continued to lose at was the game of mercy. Has anybody ever played this game of mercy? 
It's a childhood game. This is Wikipedia's definition of it, for those of you guys who uh, don't know what it is. It's a popular game of strength, skill, and endurance, where two players face each other, holding their opponent's hands. On the word go, each player attempts to bend back their opponent's hand and inflict pain by straining their wrist. When a player can no longer stand the pain, they declare defeat by shouting, mercy! It's a terrible game. This is, this is not fun at all. But yet, I continued to play it in my childhood, and I continued to call out mercy every single time. Mercy became this word that I was just commonly yelling out. Mercy no longer had a, a big definition. Mercy was just a common word for me, whether it was because I had an older brother and had to call it out constantly. Uh, I loved the song, I Can Only Imagine, by Mercy Me. I grew up under Uncle Jesse saying, have mercy, right? We, this mercy word became just an ordinary common word for me. It lacked the depth that it originally had. It no longer carried its meaning. You see, the word mercy in this passage should carry the same shock and awe that the previous Beatitudes in it have. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And blessed are the merciful. See, mercy should have that same shock and awe as the previous Beatitudes. So a question that I had to ask going before this passage and that we're going to ask this morning is how is mercy defined? You see, with, with any responsible Bible study, you have to examine a word not just what it means in today's culture and today's language. We have to examine a word and what it means in the culture that was heard and written in and what it meant in that language. All right, the, the, this means that it's more of just a Webster's Dictionary lookup of a word, but rather a biblically rounded definition of a word. So a good place to start when defining a word is mercy. So let's look at what mercy is not. The first thing we see is that mercy is not pity. All right, pity may be the beginning stages of mercy. Mercy may find its roots in pity, but mercy does not find its conclusion in pity or sympathy or compassion. It does not end with a thinking of someone's. It does not end with, an, with a feeling or an emotion, but yet mercy extends past that it pleads for more. Mercy is not simply an emotion or a feeling. It is not simply pity or compassion. The second thing we see is that mercy is not justice. Now, we, I think we know this, but justice is still oftentimes our go-to response in these situations. When we see someone who's going um, to suffer the consequence of something we've done, nah, it's all right, it, it's just. Mercy is not the first thing that pops into our mind, but rather justice is. A mother once approached Napoleon, the emperor, seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice, and justice demanded his life. The woman said, but, but I don't seek justice, I ask for mercy. Napoleon said, but, but your son doesn't deserve mercy. The mother wisely said, if, it was, if it's mercy, then of course he's not going to deserve it. Mercy you don't deserve. Mercy isn't just. I seek mercy, not justice. The emperor then showed mercy on her son and spared him. But you see, she understood this distinction that mercy is not just justice in any situation. Although God is a just God and justice is very important, it does not replace or trump mercy as it often does within our lives. See, mercy is not justice. Mercy is not pity. And we also see that mercy is not religion. By religion here, I'm speaking of the, um, the, the activities, the, the ritualistic ceremonies within religion, the ceremonial acts done by believers. Now, these acts in no way are wrong, but they can't be done at the expense of of mercy. Jesus, Jesus talks about this several, several times throughout Scripture. I'm going to read a few of them for you today. Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13 says, 
And as Jesus reclined at, at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Here the word sacrifice is, is a word that's representing those, those legalistic, those ritualistic um, aspects of religion that we go to day in and day out while setting aside mercy. Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24 say, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. See, both of these animals were unclean to the Israelites. The gnat and the camel were both unclean. And what he's saying here is that when you go to drink, you are so focused on straining out that small gnat. You're so focused on that small, menial aspect of religion, but you'll go and swallow a camel like it's no big deal. You won't show mercy and walk away like it's nothing. You focus on these small aspects of religion, thinking that that makes it all right, that you are not showing mercy in your regular lives. He's saying that mercy goes far beyond these religious experiences, far beyond these religious actions. Mercy is not religion. So now that we know what mercy is not, we can go back to what mercy is, right? What is mercy? The Greek word for mercy, uh, is eleemon, all right? And, and that's very, very well translated to mercy. The Greek word and the English word have very, very similar definitions. But we have to remember that the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus taught there on the Mount, was not in Greek. He, he spoke it in Aramaic. So the word that he most likely used when speaking the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples and followers was the word chesed. It's an Aramaic and Hebrew word chesed, which is seen all throughout the Old Testament. This is such a, a deep, deep love and a deep, deep kindness, a deep mercy. One theologian, explain, one theologian explains it this way. It does not mean only to sympathize with a person in the popular sense of the term. It does not mean simply to feel sorry for someone in trouble. Chesed means the ability to get right inside the other person's skin until we can see things with his eyes, think things with his mind, and feel things with his feelings. You see, mercy is empathizing to the extreme. We see this from the word that Jesus spoke, right? This is serious. This is a big deal. This isn't just seeing someone, oh, they're hurting. No, this is trying to understand their pain, trying to be one with them and experience the world through their eyes to truly understand what they are going through. This is empathizing to the extreme. But we also see that mercy is exemplified in the story of the Good Samaritan. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. What's going on is Jesus is teaching and a lawyer stands up trying to test Jesus and he says, how might I enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, well, what does the law say? And the lawyer, knowing it very well, says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you're right, absolutely. The lawyer continuing to test Jesus says, yes, but, but who's my neighbor? And then Jesus goes into this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii 
and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Then Jesus said, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, well, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus' response was, go and do likewise. You see, this, pic- this picture that Jesus paints of the Good Samaritan isn't just a fun story. It's not just to prove a point, but it gives us a grasp of what he means when he says chesed. It means, well, what does mercy mean? And the story of the Good Samaritan shows us. There are several things that we see that the Samaritan does. First of all, we see that he has eyes for distress. As he is going down the road, he sees the man beaten and hurting on the side of the road and recognizes his pain. This is something that I would argue that that I do very poorly and I believe others do as well. How often do we go about life constantly focused on our own pain, constantly focused on our own hurt, our own struggles that we fail to have eyes for those in distress? We are surrounded by people who are hurting. We are surrounded by people in trouble at work, at home, in your neighborhood, here at Hollywood Community Church. You are surrounded by people who are hurting. And if just for a second we could have eyes for distress, maybe we could be a church of mercy. See, the Good Samaritan had eyes for distress, but not only did he see the man and recognize his pain, but he had a heart of sympathy. He had a heart of sympathy. This is the area in which the the priest and the Levite um, wavered from the Good Samaritan. You see, they saw him and they recognized his pain, but there was no sympathy or anything in their heart. They went to the other side as to not see him or pretend to not see him. But the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, it says, had compassion when he saw him. See, mercy has a heart of compassion for those that are hurting. When we have eyes for distress, we see people in pain and it doesn't end there, but rather we feel sympathy, we feel compassion for the hurt that those people are going through. We see the world as they're going through and we recognize their pain. But it doesn't end there as we talked before, right? Mercy doesn't end with a feeling of compassion or sympathy, but rather we see that the good Samaritan had hands to help. See, as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't stop with pity, but rather rather mercy calls for action. And we see the great action that the Samaritan did on that road, binding his wounds, taking him to an inn, saving his life. See, this drastic story of the Good Samaritan, this is mercy. This is that word that I called out so much as a child. This is what that word means. It means to have eyes for distress. It means to have a heart of sympathy. It means to have hands to help. Now that we know what the Israelites heard when Jesus was teaching them on that mountain, when he said chesed, they understood that mercy. They had grasped that deep, deep meaning. But they also had to understand, how does this mercy relate to us? Well, let's look at the story of the gospel in order to figure that out, all right? This point is going to be my most theological point, so this is going to be the hardest part to get through, all right? So just give me your attention and put on your thinking caps a little bit, all right? See, the Israelites understood that we were created to show mercy. They they understood that we were created in the image of God. Now, God being a merciful God, therefore his image would show mercy. Now, I know the question that that I'm going to receive most likely, and so I want to go ahead and answer, is how can a God show mercy if there is no sin? But we believe that God is an un changing God. So there wasn't a time when all of a sudden he started showing mercy, but rather God has always been and always will be a merciful God. Before sin, and once we are in heaven, he is still a merciful God. Therefore, his image that he created in Adam and Eve was an image of mercy as well. See, we are mercy designed. What I mean by this is we are, we are created to be 
merciful. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We know that since God is a merciful God, his image must be merciful as well. Therefore, we were created in the image of God. We were created to be merciful. But the Israelites there, his followers knew that that's not where the story of the gospel ended, right? They knew that it did not end in the Garden of Eden, but rather there was a fall. There was a a sin. Sin has marred God's design. This design of mercy that God created us in was marred, was changed, was messed up when Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis 3, 6 through 7 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. See, in that moment, in that first disobedience from God, that image of God, that beautiful image was marred. I have this mirror up here. Right, this mirror, there's Brad Pitt again, by the way. If you see him, how you doing? Um, all right, but the, this, this is a reflection of me, right? I'm wearing a black shirt, so therefore the reflection also has a black shirt on, right? Now, it itself, the mirror is not wearing a black shirt, but it has the image of wearing a black shirt, right? So were we created. When we were created in the image of God, we were this reflection of God. We were not God, but we were a reflection of God. Therefore, God's attributes were reflected in us. But when Adam and Eve sinned, that image was marred. Think of me punching this mirror and cracking it because I have such brute strength. All right? Now, when this mirror is cracked, that image is no longer perfect, but rather there are portions that are, that are marred, that are messed up. It is not a perfect image of me. There are pieces missing. There are pieces that not are, are not as clear as they once were. And that's what happened when sin entered into the world. We were created as a beautiful image, a reflection of God. But when sin entered into the world, that image was marred. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. You see, the sin isn't just Adam's. I'm not going to say for you, but I know that I sin on a regular basis. I know that I disobey God and in no way live up to standard which he, which he um, desires of perfection. But I am a sinner. We see it in this world so regularly. We live in a broken world. We live in a world of sin. Just this morning, the shootings in Michigan, six dead. And that's the world we live in. This isn't a world that is a reflection of God, but rather this is a marred, a broken world. A broken, messed world up world that we live in. And the purpose of the law that was given to the Israelites was to make this apparent. You see, the law magnifies our need. The Israelites realizing that they were created for mercy, then realizing that that image of mercy was marred through sin, they were given a law. And this law was not to save This was not a salvific law, but rather this was a law to magnify their need for another. Uh, I I took college. I'm working on my master's degree, and and every once in a while you have these, these tests that are open book. Now that is like just a kiss from heaven when you hear about an open book test. All right, but my first one, I was in college, um, and I heard it was open book, and I have always been a fantastic student. I am just incredible, all right? I was always such a good student. I was like, this is no big deal. I got this class. I know theology, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is going to be easy. I don't need a book. Yeah, (laughs) you feel my pain. 
So I went and I took this test, didn't have my book with me. I got this, no big deal. First question. Oh, what in the world? Second question. That is math. I swear, we did not study this. I went through this test and I realized that I desperately needed the book. Now, I always needed the book. That wasn't a question. It was my arrogance that made me think I didn't need it. But really, what really magnified my need, what made it so apparent that I needed the book and had my book for all the tests that followed, was that test, right? Those questions revealed it magnified my need for something else. That's what the law is doing. See, he's, he's, he's telling these Jewish people, these Jewish listeners... He, he comes before them preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and they have this understanding that they are broken and that the law points out their need. And then Christ comes before them with the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to point out something that, that, that maybe we haven't thought about. But I believe that the Sermon on the Mount has, has two purposes here, that the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is twofold. I believe that that Christ is preaching the Sermon on the Mount not as necessarily a sermon of grace, although that is an aspect, but rather a furtherance of the law. This is something firm that Martin Luther believed, that, that the Sermon on the Mount was an extension of the law, that as he goes through, he is taking the bar of the law and raising it even more. We're going to get to some of these passages, but Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 22 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. There's the law. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Even in today's passage, he's saying, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Saying, whoever's merciful will show mercy. I don't know about you guys, but this is a standard that I cannot live to meet. See, the point that Jesus is is, is calling out to his followers here is, you need me. You can't do this on your own. You are in desperate, desperate need, and I am the answer. This is what he's telling them here. You see, the Son fulfills our need. The need that the law magnifies, the Son fulfills. The Son fulfills our need. Later in the chapter, in verse 17, we'll see that Jesus says that he not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Meaning that Christ is the answer to the need that the sermon professes. The sermon points out that we have a desperate need and the fulfillment of that need is found in the person of Jesus Christ. His disciples would soon understand what that meant. Us looking back, we have that realization. As we go through this Sermon on the Mount, we are going to see some high weighty standards that on our own ability are impossible to meet. And our need for him is going to be greater than we have ever realized. But find hope, because he is the fulfillment of our need. See, because it is through his son that we have been given mercy divine. See, we have been given mercy divine. We have mercy divine because God has shown us mercy you see, he looked down on us in our, in our great need that the law magnified. He saw us in our pain. And instead of just doing what was just, he had mercy. 1 Peter 1, 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the comfort. I know I'm a sinner. 
I know from my life's experience that I do not have it figured out, that I desperately fall short of God's standards. But God has shown me mercy. God has shown me mercy in that he sent his son to die on the cross and if I place my faith in him, I can spend eternity with him in heaven. See, this is the mercy that I have received. received. I in no way deserve this. I in no way deserve his love. It is not just. It is not just for me, a sinner, to do that. But rather, it is just in God's eyes for the penalty of my sin to be put on Christ so that when I place my faith in him, I can spend eternity in heaven. I think that the sermon has a second point, though. The sermon des- desperately points out our need. But as I said, I think it gives us hope and it gives us a promise. You see, we might not be able to show mercy on our own power, by our own power. But through God's mercy on us, God allows us to be merciful. God allows us to be merciful. Luke 6 Verse 36 says, be merciful even as your father is merciful. See, now we have been called to be merciful. This beautiful picture of chesed that he talks about, this picture of mercy, this is what we have been called to and now can accomplish because of the mercy of God. John Piper says it this way, the mercy that God blesses is itself the blessing of God. It grows up like fruit in a broken heart and a meek spirit and a soul that hungers and thirsts for God to be merciful. Mercy comes from mercy. Our mercy to each other comes from God's mercy to us. See, we have been shown a great, great mercy. Now it's our turn to show the same mercy. Christ uh, tells a story uh, about the, the forgiven servant. I don't know, I'll summarize the story, the parable for you. But there's the servant that owes the king uh, 10,000 talents. Now a talent is about 15 to 20 years wage. That is a lot of money, just one. And this man owes him 10,000 talents. Now Christ is pur- purposefully using exaggeration in this parable. He's saying that he owed an amount that he could never possibly pay. And the king calls this man to him and forgives him of his debt. He has mercy on him and forgives him of his debt. But now that servant goes and there was a man that owed him a small, much, much smaller amount of money. But rather than showing mercy on his friend, he sends him to prison. The king's response is not one of joy or being pleased, but rather he calls the man and rebukes him. How could you, in sight of the mercy that I have shown you, now not be merciful towards your brother? That's what we're talking about this morning. We see through the gospel story, through the Israelites' understanding, right, that we are in desperate need and that God has shown us a great mercy that we could never repay. Now, how does it make sense that we go about on a daily basis not showing mercy? See, God allows us to be merciful. We talked about it. There are so many people hurting in South Florida. There are so many people with pain that I could never understand. And we have been called to show them mercy. Few statistics for you. There are over 7,000 children in foster care right now here in Dayton, Broward County. These are children that, that have only experienced the hurt and pain of this world and desperately need to be shown mercy. 150 children enter foster care system on a monthly basis. One out of five children who age out of foster care become homeless. And seven out of ten girls who age out become pregnant by the age of 21. You see, they are a hurting 
people. This is just one small section of foster children, but there are people who are hurting in South Florida, and those are the people that we have been called to show mercy to. So I ask you, when you leave here, do you have eyes of distress? Are you able to see the pain that another is going through? Do you have a heart of sympathy where you feel their pain, where you feel their hurt? And does it go a step further and do you help? We know that God was the good Samaritan, that he was the one that saved us in our great pain. But now we're called also to go and show mercy.